Hold them up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'll never, never, never doubt this word because it is the word of God. So I've got ears to hear and a heart to receive. So teach to me the word of God. So I believe it. I receive it into my life right now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. I want to talk about fire on the altar tonight. You got to have some fire on the altar. Everybody's got to have Holy Ghost fire on the altar of your heart. And the church said, Amen and Amen. I'm going to know how much fire you got by how many Amens I get tonight. <laughs> amen. There's a relationship, a correlation between the fire in the Amen corner. Come on. So I want to talk about fire on the altar. Everybody say, Fire on the altar. Fire. Jesus baptized us in the Holy Ghost and fire. You got to have fire on the altar. John the Baptist said, indeed I baptize you in water, but there is one who comes after me that is greater than me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandal. He will baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. John the Baptist said, I'm a baptizer. I know about baptizing, but there's one coming after me with another baptism. He said, I baptize in water. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And, everybody say, and uh, the fire is important. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus said John was the greatest prophet up to that time. And indeed, he came in the spirit of Elijah, and he prophesied there was one coming greater than him. That was Jesus. John was a baptizer. Jesus was a baptizer, is a baptizer. John's ministry was baptisms. That's why we call him John the Baptist. The Lord's ministry is baptizing us with the Holy Ghost. Come on, church, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, here's the amazing thing about fire. John went on to say that that fire will quench or eat up or burn up the chaff. Speaking of sin, the fire burns the chaff, but the fire also purifies the gold. Isn't it amazing? Same fire does two completely different things depending on the lives that it touches. Isn't that an amazing thing? Depending on the lives that is touched, the same fire gets two completely different results. One, it burns up the chaff. The other, it purifies the gold. The Holy Ghost fire, the Bible says in Hebrews, the Lord is an unquenchable fire, a consuming fire. But when you read in the book of Exodus, when Moses met the Holy Ghost in the burning bush, it did not consume the bush. In fact, it was so unusual to him that he turned to see, why isn't the bush being consumed? And that's when God spoke to him out of the bush. The Holy Ghost can consume the chaff, but the Holy Ghost does not have to consume the bush. What does that mean? The Holy Ghost can consume the sin in our lives, but not kill the man. Hallelujah. Somebody say, thank God. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the Holy Ghost lives on the inside and he's purifying the gold? Hallelujah. If you don't come to Jesus, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, you're going to have a very different experience with the Holy Ghost. 
one day in the future, you're going to have a very different experience. Your experience with the Holy Ghost is the same experience that Paul had with the Holy Ghost on the Damascus Road. He, it prodded him. It prodded him. The Holy Spirit was prodding. Jesus said to Saul on the Damascus Road, it's hard to kick against the pricks. You know what? The pricks is a sharp stick that moves the cattle. The Holy Ghost was moving him to Jesus. Holy Ghost was moving him, pricking him, pricking him, pricking him, trying to move him to Jesus. That's our relationship before we come to the Lord. But a day is coming when it's going to be too late and the judgment of God is coming and the Holy Ghost is going to burn up the chaff. I'm so glad I'm a born again believer, aren't you? I'm so glad uh, that the Holy Spirit has a different ministry in my life now. He's burning up the sin, but he's leaving the man. He's purifying the gold. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, hallelujah. Yeah. So John the Baptist knew all about baptisms. And he knew that, they, and he prophesied that Jesus would come with a greater baptism. And that baptism would be the baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not everybody is going to react the same way to the things of God. Jesus taught us that in the parable of the sower. The seed is the same. The ground is different. The results are different as. The seed is the Word of God, but it was sown onto wayward ground, thorny ground, stony ground, and good ground. Only one quarter of the ground received the word uh, and produced fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Stony ground couldn't let it root. Thorny ground choked it to death. Wayward ground blew away, got eaten up by the birds. Only one quarter of those who heard the word received the word and allowed it produce fruit in their lives. Not everybody that has an experience with God is going to bear fruit of that experience. That's why you can have people sitting in a church service and some have a life-changing experience. And it's, that is exactly what I needed to hear. Thank you, God. And some say, that's the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. I've got to get out of this place. Come on. It's the same message, but two completely different reactions because the heart is different. The Holy Ghost. This is why, I, this is not my notes, but I'm on it. This is why the Bible says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. You say, man, well, that doesn't sound very fair. No, listen. The sun shining on the earth Soften some things and harden some things. Come on. Leave a candle out in the sun and it's going to be a puddle in about an hour. Leave mud out in the sun and it's going to be hard as rock. It's God shining upon the life. But the life doesn't react the same to God Pharaoh was hardened by God. It's not that God hardened him. God was just God to him. He couldn't receive God, so he was hardened by God. It hardened him. He had an experience with God. He could have been softened by God. He could have turned to God. He could have yielded to God. But he was hardened because God was God to him, and he wouldn't yield problem was he saw himself as a God. That was the problem right there. The problem was he saw himself as a God. He says, there's only room for one God in Egypt, God, and that's going to be me. And God says, we'll just see about that. <laughs> we'll just see about that. Glory to God. Fire is essential to the Christian experience. Fire is essential to your relationship with the Lord. Fire is essential to the worship experience. Fire is essential to your daily experience with Jesus. And there has to be fire on the altar of your heart. In fact, Paul told Timothy, fan the flames. Stir it up, Timothy. 
Stir up the gift that is within you. In the original language, it means fan the flames. Fan the flame. There's a fire in you, Timothy. Don't you let it go out. Don't you die. He said in the original language, fan the embers. Things can die down to where you just see the embers. Paul said, no, 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 no. I laid hands on you, Timothy. There was an impartation to you, Timothy. You have a sincere faith, Timothy. Now you fan that flame. You stir it up. There's a gift of God in you. Don't let it go out. But it's Timothy's job. It's Timothy's job. It's Timothy's job to fan the flame. Timothy had to do it. What's going on inside of you, you are responsible for. It's your job to fan the flames of God in your heart. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say it out loud. I'm responsible for me. My spiritual walk is my responsibility. That's a true statement. It should be your chief concern, your spiritual walk. Now, fire on the altar is one of the most dramatic occurrences throughout Scripture. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. And there's a pattern to it. And it's very, very interesting because it's very, very significant. In these these summit experiences, in these pinnacle experiences with God, God can do things very, very dramatically. (laughs) Hallelujah. God shows himself strong. He doesn't mess around. God shows himself strong. He showed himself strong when he saved your soul. God showed himself strong in demonstration to the nation in the Old Testament, in demonstration to the church in the New Testament. And fire fell on the altar. Fire fell on the altar in the tabernacle. Fire fell on the altar in Solomon's temple. Fire fell on the altar in this temple right here. Fire. Everybody say fire. On the altar. Got to have it. I said, got to have it. God insists upon it. Non-negotiable. This is what happens. That which is dedicated to God gets sanctified and approved by His presence and by the fire on the altar. And the fire on the altar eats up, absolutely turns to ash, absolutely consumes the sin offering. The fire comes down, consumes the sin offering, and you move from the altar to the holy place, then to the holy of holies. Glory to God. I'm so glad that Jesus was our sin offering. Hallelujah. Now we just go straight in. The veil has been rent. Now we just go straight in to the holy of holies. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh boy, this should be a shouting house right now. Hallelujah. We go straight in to the holy of holies because the fire's been on the altar. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to make the point, and then I want to go through a couple of things. I want to make the point. When the fire falls on the altar on the day of dedication, it does that The priests then keep the fire burning. Fire falls, consumes the offering. The priests keep the fire going. The fire never goes out. The priests keep it going. Now, watch with me. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23. I want to talk about the dedication of the temple, Moses' tabernacle, I meant to say, Moses' tabernacle. And then I want to fast forward to the dedication of Solomon's temple. And then I want to talk about Zerubbabel's temple. And then I want to talk about you 
the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are y'all ready for this? Okay, let's do it. Leviticus chapter 9, verse 23. And Moses and Aaron went out into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And all the people saw it, and they fell on their faces. I would too. (laughs) Amen. Wouldn't you? But you see the pattern, and the pattern, the sequence here is there is the day of dedication, the glory fills the temple, the fire falls on the altar, consumes the sin offering, and the people are humbled before God. On the day of dedication, when Moses and Aaron dedicated the tabernacle in the wilderness, and this was central to the nation identity. This was central to nation life. It was right literally in the center of the camp. All of the 12 tribes were encamped round about it like spokes of a wheel, really forming a shape of a cross more like it. And then the the tabernacle of the wilderness was dedicated by Moses and Aaron, and the glory filled out. In fact, if you go back a few chapters, you'll see that the weight of the glory was on the ministers such that they could not even stand. This is where we in the New Testament church get an understanding of falling out in the Spirit. People say, why is everybody, you you lay hands on them and they fall out in the Spirit. Well, those who are yielded to the glory just fall out in the Holy Ghost. We didn't come up with it. They were doing it back in Solomon's temple. Come on, church. So Moses dedicated the tabernacle. The glory filled the tabernacle. The fire fell upon the altar of the tabernacle, and the people were humbled as a result. Notice the sequence of events. Now, in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 13, the order was, I'm going to begin in verse 12, Leviticus 6 and 12, and the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. This is the command now. Once the fire hits the altar, they're commanded, it shall be kept burning, burning on it. It shall not be put out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning, lay the burnt offering in order on it. He shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings, verse 13. And a fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. So here, here it is. On the day of dedication, divine fire falls from heaven, out from the throne room of God, hits the altar, burns up the sin offering, but it is the priest's responsibility to keep it going. It did not happen every day that fire fell, fire fell, fire fell, fire fell. No, it fell on the day of dedication And then they kept it going. Okay? Now, let's fast forward to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. When Solomon then built a permanent house of worship called the temple in Jerusalem, city of David, when he built the permanent house of worship, on the day of dedication, Solomon prayed a prayer The prayer was so good that the ministers started falling out under the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm looking forward to that prayer. When I start praying and y'all just start falling out. Oh, Lord, I open my eyes and y'all just laying all over the floor. Hallelujah. 2 Chronicles 7 and 1. And Solomon had finished praying... Fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. 
When all the children of Israel saw how fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good and his mercy endures forever. I'd be saying exactly the same thing. Glory to God. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. So, same sequence of events. There is the day of dedication. The glory fills the temple. The fire falls from God it consumes the sin offering and then the priests keep the fire going and the people bow themselves in worship before the Lord powerful powerful stuff glory to God but that temple was torn down and that temple was torn down when the Babylonians crushed the nation of Israel carried them away into captivity and the, the temple and all of the, the articles of the temple were carried away to Babylon and then there had to be a rebuilding. And the rebuilding was done by Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel in 538 before Christ, Zerubbabel returned from Babylon to rebuild the temple. And you remember Nehemiah coming back with Ezra to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, the temple was under construction. They got a lot of resistance. There was a a lot of apathy as well. In fact, construction stopped for 16 years. In fact, Some of the construction materials that was meant for the temple were taken by the people. So they built their own houses with the things that were meant intended for the house of God. That was not received well by the Lord. And so it was delayed and delayed, but it finally got rebuilt again. But the one thing that was missing was the glory of the Lord. Ezra chapter 1, verse 5, God stirred the hearts of the priests and the Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to go to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple of the Lord, and all their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock. They gave them many valuable gifts in addition to all the voluntary offerings. Even King Cyrus himself brought out of the articles that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem and placed in the temple of his own gods. So, when Solomon's temple was destroyed, the glory left. And we see that in Ezekiel 10 and 18. The glory of the Lord departed from the threshold, the temple that stood over the cherubim. When the glory departed, when the temple was destroyed, the glory departed. When Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple, the glory was not there. The fire did not fall. And scholars wonder and they and they postulate for the reasons that maybe that glory did not fall maybe it was because that the ark of the covenant was not returned to the temple maybe it was because that the lord the glory of the lord had departed from the threshold of the temple that many years earlier but the glory did return There was a day when glory walked through the gates of the temple. And that glory was found in the person of Jesus Christ. He was the glory of the Lord. And the glory did not return to Zerubbabel's temple that was transformed into Herod's temple until the glory himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, walked in into that temple. This is what Scripture says. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lord. John 1 and 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory and the, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yes, the glory came back to the temple when God became a man, Jesus Christ, full of glory. And when he walked into the temple, finally the glory was back in the house of God. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
But that temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Not a rock left on another one. Destroyed. Tabernacle of the wilderness, gone. Solomon's temple, gone. Zerubbabel's temple, gone. And every one of those had a day of dedication. Glory was found within it eventually in Zerubbabel's temple by Jesus. But now there's nothing but empty ground. But God was not done because he had a better temple in mind. Someone say, praise the Lord. Someone say, praise the Lord. God had a whole new architecture project in mind. Someone, praise the Lord. Paul told the church at Corinth, don't you know you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Yes, it was on the day of Pentecost. It was on the dedication of the new temple that they were all gathered together in one place in an upper room. And what happened? The glory filled the house and the fire fell upon them. Come on, church. The fire fell upon them like as of cloven tongues, and it rested upon each one of them, and they all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When the new temple was being dedicated to the Lord, glory to God, the fire fell out upon that temple. The Holy Ghost fire fell into the altar. It burned up the sin offering. Glory to God. And they worshiped Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is why those who are contrary to Pentecost and the baptism of the Spirit, they'll say, Oh, you speak in other tongues. And I'll say, yes. And they'll say, how come cloven tongues of fire do not sit on your head when you are speaking in tongues? And I will say, that happens one time at the day of dedication. Read your Bible. It happened one time at the tabernacle. It happened one time at the temple. It happened one time in the upper room. Now it is the priest's job to keep the fire burning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do y'all see it? Isn't it perfect? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It doesn't have to fall every time. It just has to fall the first time. And then we've got to keep it going Paul said, Timothy, fan the flames, Timothy, fan the flames, Timothy, fan the flames, fan the flames, Timothy. Do you know that there is a different fire called strange fire? Strange fire isn't the real deal. Looks like it, but it ain't it. There's a lot of things that look like the Holy Ghost, but are not the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of religiosity that looks good, but it ain't. There's a, there's a form of godliness, but it denies and it lacks the power thereof. There's fire, and then there's strange fire. There's the real deal, then there's the counterfeit. And Nahab and Abihu offered strange fire before the Lord, and God ate them up. They met the real fire. Because it says in Leviticus 10 and 1, Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Ahab, Aaron, took either of them his censer, put fire in it, put incense thereon, and offered strange fire. Everybody say strange fire. Strange fire. This is not holy fire, not God-ordained fire, strange fire. Strange fire from the Lord, which he commanded them not and there went out fire from the Lord, devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You know when that happened? 
That happened the very day that the real fire fell on the day of dedication on the tabernacle in the wilderness. These two young men, the sons of Aaron, saw Moses and Aaron come out of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, having met with God, made dedication to the Lord, saw the glory of the Lord, the fire from God come down, eat the offering, and then they took up fire on the same day. Took up fire which was not from the altar, which was not from God, and tried to go through the motions of doing something religious. And God says, Are you trying to mimic my fire? Are you trying to make believe with my fire? You can't do that with the things of God. God's not going to tolerate that. You can't play God. You can't mess around with the Holy Ghost. Hey, Jesus said, listen, you can do a lot of things, but don't you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Don't you start attributing things to the Holy Ghost that are not of the Holy Ghost. Don't you play games with God. And these two young men, they should have known better. Their father was Aaron, the high priest, and they offered strange fire. And God said, let me show you the real fire. And God ate them up right there. Hallelujah. 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 Someone say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Yes. I say, thank God for the real thing. Yes. We got the real thing. Yes. We don't have to play. We don't have to play. We got the Holy Ghost. Yes. But we do have to fan the flames. Because Paul told Timothy... In 2 Timothy 1 and 6, this is why I remind you, Timothy, fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Stir it up. Isn't it easy to let it die out? Isn't it easy to let the gift of God Got, get put on the back burner. Let it just die out. Isn't it easy to neglect the things of God? Isn't it easy to say, well, I'm a little too busy. I, I'm, a, my pressure, I'm under a lot of pressure here, God. I, I've got a lot on my mind, God. I'm under a lot of stress here, Lord. I've, I've got things to do. And the Lord says, are you going to play with strange fire? I'm giving you the real deal. I'm giving you gifts and callings and anointing and power and spiritual authority. I'm giving you my word. I'm giving you my mantle. I'm giving you the Holy Ghost. Now, what are you going to do with it? And too very often. We say, we'll get back to it at some later date. Hallelujah. One of my mentors that I watch on video, I don't know him in person. In fact, he's in heaven now. But one of, one of the fellows I watch a lot on video, teacher, he says, what is it that people can watch a, a sporting event and shout their lungs out three, four, five hours at a sitting. And go to church and get a 30 minutes sermon and think they've got it all. Five hours of sporting event, 30 minutes of God. He says the balance isn't right. No, it doesn't balance out. I said it doesn't balance out. Hallelujah. Fan the flames. That's my message tonight. Fan the flames. God has poured fire out on the altar. It's our responsibility to fan the flames. There's gifts in you. There's callings in you. 
There's anointings on you. There's mantle on you. The Holy Ghost is in you. God Almighty lives in you. The creator of all of heaven and earth is looking to create things in your life. He lives in you. What are you going to do about it? I say fan the flames. Fan the flames. Fan the flames. Fan the flames of the gift of God that was given you by the laying on of hands. And the church said, Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. Well, I say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. I say bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless service. It's a sign. It's an operation of faith. I want the fan that you have in your hand, that you're fanning the flames of your gift and your calling, your anointing. When I ask you to stand, if you're able, I want you to walk down to this altar. That's going to be a sign that I'm fanning the flames that the gift of God is the chief responsibility of my life. So on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand. And as soon as you hit your feet, I want you to come on out. Come right down to the altar. I'm not going to lay hands on anybody. I'm just going to ask God to fan the gift of God in you. So one, two, three, let's stand. Come on down to the altar. Worship team, come minister to us. We're going to fan the flame for just a minute before we close. There's gifts in you. There's callings in you. There's anointings in you. Yeah, come on, worship team. Yes, more. I want more of you. Come on, let's fan that flame. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. of Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord, that you would pour your anointings out upon us with another baptism with the Holy Spirit. Fill us to overflowing with the initial physical, biblical evidence of praying and worshiping in other tongues. I pray, Lord God, right now the fire is falling afresh and anew upon the altar and we're fanning the flames. So let us worship Him in spirit and in truth right now. Oh, Rihanna, Masi, 
Maria la ma, Ariana Maria la ma, Ariana ma, Bocoria la ma, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Come on, everybody, say it with me, Alleluia. Sing it again, Alleluia. Sing it again. Alleluia. 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 Oriana Maria Lama. Alana Maria Lama. Oriana Maria Lama. Maria Lama, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Oh, come, let us bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the church said amen and amen. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow for prayer. Widow's ministry tomorrow as well. See you Sunday. God bless.